What's up, everybody? Welcome. Welcome to the Comet ML Open Office Hours powered by the Artists of Data Science. Super excited to have all of you guys here today. Uh, hopefully, you got a chance to check out the episode that I released for the Artists of Data Science podcast a couple of days ago. It was with Dr. Kevin Zolman. We talked about the game theory. That episode is titled Pulling the Grim Trigger which is a cheeky play on words because Grim Trigger is a strategy that, um, that is played in, in game theory for Prisoner's Dilemma. Um, hopefully all you guys, guys also got a chance to check out the uh, office hour session or rather the happy hour session from Friday. Um, but super excited to have all of you guys here. What's up, everybody? We got we got Christian, we got Christoph, we've got Tor. I see Christoph has a, uh, a cute companion with him today. Nice to see all you guys here, man. Uh, how's everybody's weekend been going, man? Not too bad. Just uh, doing some errands, getting some grocery shopping done this morning and a workout. And Nice, uh, man. Yeah, just some reading, some podcast listening. Listen nice. to your podcast on game theory yesterday. So that yeah, was awesome. Yeah, did you enjoy it? Yeah, I appreciate Yeah, it's awesome. Awesome Nice, content. man. What are, you, uh, what are you reading nowadays? Um, right now, I'm actually doing the ML in 150 pages. Um I actually can't remember. I just have it on my phone. I can't remember the author, but author, but you recommended it actually. Yeah. Um, I think you're, you're reading a more deep dive ML book right now by the same author. I can't remember the name of the author actually, but uh, um, yeah, I wonder it, you, it's not the hundred page machine learning book, is it? That's, that's yeah, probably, that's yeah. the one I'm currently reading. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, I've got, yeah, I've got a couple of interesting books that I'm, that I'm getting into this week just to prepare for some podcasts I got coming up with in the, in the near future. I got, uh, no Hard Feelings by Liz Fossling. She uh, sent me a copy of this book, Liz. Thank you very much. Uh, she's quite well known on uh, across many social medias for uh, having these really cool and interesting, um, like I guess, animations. Is that the right word for it? Cartoon drawings. Um, wow. so they've been pretty cool. And then another one I'm reading right now is uh, The Book of Why to prepare for an interview I have with uh, Dana McKenzie, which is the co-author of this book. So this book is amazing i'm really enjoying this um it's one that i'll be referring back to even after the interview like I, i'm going through it quickly right now just to come up with questions to ask but this is one that i need to go through um and i'll probably read this one at least 20 30 times um over the course of my lifetime because it's really changing um the way i view probability and statistics it's quite interesting um but yeah Right on, man. Well, happy to have you guys here, uh, man. I, I wish I wish that I could do something to make these office hours more pop and more more packed, like my Friday sessions are. Um, I don't I don't know if that I don't know if it means that people just don't find me as interesting, so they just don't want to come to the one where it's only me, or if uh, or what it is. But hey, I'm I'm glad you guys are faithful in here all the time, hanging out. Um, so uh, right now, man, if anybody has any questions on anything, um, I'm happy to uh, to to help out. So uh, let's go with that. See a couple of new faces. Uh, I think Christian, this might be your first time here. We got Mohit coming in. We got Dave. Dave, man, good to see you as well. Um, but yeah, like Mohit, I see you are uh, unmuted. So if you have a question, by all means, I'm happy to uh, to help however I can. Oh, I just uh, dropped in. You know, I got to know about Comet like in the past week. Uh... Recruiter reached out and uh, and it was very interesting and so <laughs> yeah uh, yeah and I kind of uh, thought this happy hour idea was a great idea yeah uh, Comet's they, pretty cool yeah so uh, just for the record I, I don't uh, work with Comet or yeah, and, Comet and, and, even though I wish I did because uh, that seems like a really cool place and Gideon is a really cool dude um, but they're building some really interesting products definitely think that they're uh, uh, experimentation platform is amazing um it's probably one of my favorites so yeah. definitely worth checking out uh, but yeah man glad glad you can join us um, I, actually i mean uh, just as i discovered comet i discovered your podcast like yeah. oh, right on man <laughs> uh have you gotten a chance to to tune in to any episodes as of yet no no not not yet i'm just just sort of like exploring um, yeah, well, hopefully more. you get a chance to. Um, I've, my podcast is a bit different than most data science podcasts. Most data science podcasts will only talk to data scientists about data science, which is interesting up to a certain point, but I find that to be, um, it, it doesn't stretch me 
as much, right? So the reason I talk to just a wide variety of people covering a wide variety of topics is because it just pushes me way outside of, of my comfort zone and, and forces me to to really think about things that I don't get a chance to think about and ask questions around those topics and help me explore new fr frontiers. It's yeah. like, you know, I'll have like philosophers on the podcast. I don't know much about yeah. philosophy. I'm like a, an amateur philosopher in whatever. Uh, but I, I've talked to some really interesting philosophers on the, on the podcast. John Vervaki is one of them. Paul Thagard is another one. Um, Jamie Woodhouse, he's uh, kind of the founder of the sentientism. Donald Robertson, who's a Stoic philosopher. Yeah. So. Really oh, that's awesome. That's that's a great like blend. I mean, that that's hey, it's uh, your show. I don't want to take up too much. Yeah, no, no, dude. I mean, you know, there's like this uh, book. Uh, sometime back, I uh, came across the fuzzy and the techie, and like you know, you need to bring the art and the science together. And yeah, I, absolutely. I, that's what you're uh, going for. Like, awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I got to check that book out, The Fuzzy and the Techie, man. All right, that's uh, being added to the list. Actually, I interviewed somebody recently, Andy Hunt, who is a co-author of The Pragmatic Programmer, which is a very famous book for uh, for most of us um, in, in the tech field. Uh, and we spent most of our time talking about his other book, which is um, it's Pragmatic Thinking and Learning, which is all about thinking and learning better and, and how to gain expertise. And so a lot of stuff we talk about there are really fuzzy type of concepts, but he talked about how that fuzzy stuff helped propel him in his career. Yeah. So I'm excited to be releasing that at some point uh, in the near future. Uh, but fuzzy and the techie, definitely worth checking out. Right on, man. Hey, well, if at any point you got any questions or, or want to join in on the discussion, please, uh, please do. Dave, I see you're here, man. Good to good to see you. I know I noticed you from LinkedIn, always uh, being quite supportive of the post. So I'm happy to see you here as well. Tor, how's it going, man? So you got your hand up. Tor is- There having, we go. There go. I've got mute. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's good yeah, to no see problem. you guys again. Um, actually, it's a follow-up a little bit to last week uh, when Crystal mentioned about NLP. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, uh, well, you asked what we're doing this weekend. Right now, I'm kind of analyzing transactional data for an audit starting up in uh, May. And we're talking about, what, eight, 900,000 transaction lines, financial. And as part of that, uh, my Excel is reaching its quote unquote limitations. But the question I have is also related to my project in the same time that I received a contract or several. We'll be reviewing a lot of contracts. And what I'm wondering about is, is there any programs out there that can kind of scan a document based on keywords or types that I can type in? Does that exist? That's number one. And the second part is really, how do I draft this? Because for my project, I am planning to have this as one of my products. So I'm trying to draft how I want the model to work. And I'm just wondering if you could give me some input on how to do that. Yeah, so the second question is ex like far too difficult to answer in this context, but I can't oh, tell okay. you it'll take a ton of work if you're trying to build a solution from scratch. It's not going to be easy. You're going to require a lot of engineering power for that. But to answer the first question, do products exist that can kind of collapse down documents, legal documents and distill down kind of the main points? There, there do exist uh, products like that that you can um, purchase from, from third parties. The one that comes to mind uh, right off the top of the bat, there's a company called Chisel AI. And I know other companies like this exist, but what, what Chisel AI does is they specialize, you know, in this case, they specialize in uh, insurance. And what they do is they go through insurance contracts and pull out the most important stuff from that insurance contract. Um, and solutions like this exist for lawyers as well. Well, they'll, they'll, they'll use NLP type of techniques to help distill down legal documents to like key points. Um, I can't think of a name of a solution off the top of my head for that. Um, it's just not a space that I that I explore too much. Um, but if anybody has any insights here, I see Mohit might have some uh, insight. 
I, I, I recently came across one. If it's uh, if it involves OCR based on like sort of physical documents, then Eigentech mm. is. Uh, I came across one. Somebody was putting together a solution for banking and uh, for uh, the data capture from documents. They were looking at Eigentech. Eigentech. How's yeah, that so, uh, E I G E N Eigen and then yeah. technologies. It's document AI for financial services. I'll post a link here in the chat. Yeah, so, so I, 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 I don't know the uh, pricing and stuff for Eigentech, but, but I also kind of uh, uh, have been in touch with a, a team, which is uh, India-based, a team of data scientists and machine learning people. Uh, it's an 80-person company, and uh, they've actually solved this problem uh, for uh, healthcare and some, uh, uh, some of their customers of uh, data capture from documents. Uh, okay. So that's uh, they're they're called converge.ai and I can converge. put you. Yeah, and I I have no association with them except for like the founders, uh, uh, a recently sort of a uh, acquaintance and friend. Yeah, I've and for the record, I've got zero like interest in any of these companies. Um, if you guys do want to uh, sponsor any one of my podcasts and you're listening, reach out to me. Uh, yeah. But there's a uh, there's but yeah so. I, what I did was I, I did a quick search, like uh, quote AI, then quote legal documents. And there's a bunch of services that pop up, like legal proofreading powered by AI, Alexi powered by AI, um, things like this that, you know, solutions do exist, which can look through large bodies of, of text like you're talking about and extract out the most important um, bits of information. Um, I'm not too much of a expert in NLP or know too much about it. So if anybody has any tips. Um... Thor? <clears throat> yeah. Oh, this is Jaya. Yeah, so I think uh, I re recently read on LinkedIn, uh, there's this uh, company called CB Insight. They post all the latest and greatest startups that come up uh, in uh that's uh, doing some great work. And, and in, they have this big chart where they break it down to different companies. And one of them is documentation. A huge chunk of it was about documentation where how AI is being used for documentation. So there's a whole list of companies listed in that uh, image that you can kind of go through that each of those companies, like I think some of the companies being mentioned here, I don't know if they are listed in that, but the up and coming companies that have figured out how to do uh, extract uh, words out of documentation and just check out CB Insights. They are like, the, they, they do like, they, they, they do different, they, they analyze different startups that's out there. And there's one section just for documentation alone. And there are a bunch of companies over there that you can kind of check out those companies. Yeah, the much, much, the much broader term for this type of activity within the space of NLP is called information retrieval. Uh, so I sent you a link to this tutorials point document. It's right there in the chat. Uh, that can kind of give you an overview of information retrieval to see if this is kind of what you are describing for your situation, see if there's any parallels to that and if this has uh, any type of application for that, um, because it seems like like it might. Uh, yeah, and, and definitely because this, th that kind of graphical display, just how to put the idea down, because I, I know what I want to achieve. I'm just trying to figure out a way to graphically um, display the work process um, on how the various things, and LP is just one thing of it, yeah, which yeah. is actually getting the data, but of course, from the contracts, but what I need is to map it up against transaction listing okay. that I'm working on and invoices that uh, we are reviewing. Yeah, like and diagrams to kind of show. Exactly. Just here's the simplify. endpoints. Yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering if there are um, like, how do you do that? I mean, if you're working in strategy or setting up, you normally will start by making some sort of a flow chart. At least that's what I do. Mm -hmm. But I'm just trying to figure out what in, uh, elements I need to consider in kind of like that process. Yeah, I think like kind of at a high level, definitely think about what your raw inputs are because you want to kind of think of it as, as a system, right? There's going to be some input and there's going to be some output and then there's right. stuff that happens in the middle. So when you're doing this type of diagramming, then, you know, just want to clearly just say, okay, when the input comes from this end, we're going to perform these tasks, ABC, perhaps tasks ABC can be performed concurrently, right? Or maybe they have to be, you know, performed one after the other, right? Um, and mm -hmm. kind of 
draw kind of like a directed graph to to indicate the flow of information from one end of the system to the output. So the, from input to output. Um, so something like. Uh, it's not uh, sure. It's not showing exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me see. I don't know how to, but um, let's see if I hold it up. No, it doesn't show. Yeah. It's white. Uh, here, let me let me kind of show you a a, a tip here. Maybe um, because essentially what you're doing is it's called like a system diagram. I think. Uh, so kind yeah, of it, like this. It's, it's something that is not too complex, but it's also which elements and like you mentioned now input output this is a fairly uh, normal approach and then this abc and in my mind is i hadn't thought about the steps like yeah. which one is dependent upon the other for example um and then of course you need a review stage and then you need some kind of a feedback loop because mm -hmm. you know one thing is just to do the physical analysis but in time, you want the system through machine learning, artificial intelligence to kind of next time you do it, the process should be faster or it should recognize that, oh, I looked at this before. So where does that fall in? It's that kind of workflow that I'm looking for. Um, yeah. So I would, I would look for a free class on Udemy, like a, that's just a quick primer for systems diagrams. Um, because it, it to me, it sounds like that's kind of what you're needing help kind of conceptualizing. Um, so it looks like there's, I mean, there's a bunch of systems diagrams courses. You might have to uh, find one that's more suited to what you're looking for. But cool. that's one one place to start. Um, yeah, hopefully that's I'll helpful. start there and then uh, take it from there. <laughs> awesome, man. Thanks. Yeah, yeah no problem. Uh, Harper, what's the what's uh are you talking about my anglicized white uh name, my anglicized name, Harper Singson. That's my that's one of my identity identities. Uh right on man. Uh so uh, who else would like to uh to to ask a question? Dave or oh I see Jai is unmuted. Go for it. Oh I, that's okay. I, I Yeah, no, no, it's it's you. Go for it. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Um uh, I want to ask, what does pseudocode mean? I thought I understood it, but I'm not so sure now. <laughs> what does pseudocode yeah. mean? Mm -hmm. And I've got another question, but I, let me work with this first. Yeah, pseudocode is it's when you're thinking in terms of like computer programming, but you're not actually pay, paying attention to the syntax itself. So you can, you're writing in, I don't want to say plain English, but you're writing in plain language ignoring the syntax of whatever specific programming language that you choose to implement it to just kind of explain how this would work, if, if that makes sense. Um, I see a couple of people here probably have some uh, better insight. I know, Christophe, you're huge uh, into software engineering. So let's let's hear your interpretation and then also Mohit as well. Mm, so I, I just agree with, with, what you, uh, with, uh, with what you said. So it's like, I don't know, you need to build some loop. You just say, I, I build a for loop from one till length of the word, for, for example. So it doesn't matter in uh, which uh, programming language you do it. It's like, it, like Harpreet said, it's like in plain language and you can then translate it to any programming language. Yeah, so, so, so yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to give an illustrative example. Like, for example, like he's talking about a for loop, like, you know, in Python, you might say something like for i in range, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Well, pseudocode will say for every one of these things, we're going to do this. And yeah, so you kind of like that. But yeah, go for it. Go, go carry on with the question there. Sorry. Yeah, so 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 say say you have a problem, right? A, a programming problem. Uh, I I don't know how to phrase a problem. So you're you're actually kind of thinking out loud and putting it on paper and breaking that problem down like in simple English. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then when when you break those problems down into tiny tiny problems, right? There are maybe maybe there are three problems in this one big problem, and, and you're just you're just laying it out on paper. And, and breaking it down into small little problems and, and you have this pseudo code like in plain English, am I, am I right? Yeah, just kind of a way to help you think through the problem at hand. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, this kind of tra traditionally, uh, it, it's been around for so long, right? The term pseudocode, it's been around for decades, like, uh, and like flowcharts, how they help you kind of think through structurally, like how to solve a problem. And pseudocode is then the next step after you get a flowchart, then you say like, okay, let's now express this in in kind of like semi-code, but it's it's not code, it's like, it's, it's English. Okay, okay. but it, using like programming, programmatic thinking, Mm -hmm. And uh, and then like really uh, now in the new in right now we are in the age of like no, uh, no code and low code uh, tools right. right and so essentially you just uh, w w once you figure out uh, how to solve it in uh, structurally and then you just uh, kind of use uh, one of the easy tool sets and solve it mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah okay so 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 say you have a big problem and then you you break it down to three small problems each of those small problems will have also pseudo codes right that kind of explaining that small little problem am i right potentially yeah kind of yeah potentially okay. yeah okay yeah, you really want to think of just pseudocode as a way for you to kind of think through what it is that you're actually going to implement. So it's it's to more so clarify your thinking mm -hmm. while simultaneously expressing to someone on the other side of the table or yourself what it is that you hope to accomplish. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good good point. I mean, it's kind of like if you're like a business uh, you a person who or, or somebody who's who's figured out like this is what I need to solve my problem. And, and you express it in pseudocode and hand it over to a, a developer who knows the language, right? It's probably right. you're you're doing a lot of the work in like actually figuring out the the solution and, and transferring the requirements that that person needs, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the whole idea. Okay, got it. Okay, cool, thank you. And you had another question as well. Yeah, so another question I had, it's just popped in my head yesterday. When I understand when to use if else statements, because if if not that, go to the next else, go to the next one, right? When do you use if only if? Is, is that uh, uh, when do you use if? Because I see that uh, in Python programming as well. Is there such a thing? Just if only. Yeah, I I use that primarily if I'm just trying to do a truth value, like a boolean kind of like if this condition is true then perform this. I don't think you'd see an if without a then or, you know, an else, if that makes sense. Yeah, I've seen a lot of if and else a lot, yeah. but I'm just wondering when is the use case for only if? Yeah, only if you want to check the, the like truth value or the uh, uh, yes and no okay. response, right? So if X is in this list of numbers, right? Mm -hmm. And then you'll have your, we're talking Python here, right? You have your yeah. colon and that's kind of the implicit then and it'll perform these set of actions. So if this condition okay. is true, then perform this set of actions. Otherwise perform an alternative set of actions. Okay. Yeah. But I'll, I'll turn this one over to the software engineers in the house because uh, they probably got some, some better explanations. So Christoph. Um, so this, this was uh, uh, one good example. And the other one is for mm -hmm. example, to break a loop. Uh, or uh, to return from a function. So at the beginning of the function, you check some condition. And if this condition isn't there, then you just break it. I mean, I mean you return some, mm -hmm. some value, some default value maybe. I mean, it's, it's mostly for breaking some piece of code. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, yeah. Because uh, yeah, I, I do get that if if there's the, if then then do the other thing. If that doesn't happen, if the first one, if it's not true, then you go to the next one. I'm just wondering the use case for only if where does it happen? When do we use that? That, that that's that's all. Yeah. Okay. It's also uh, like with uh, with boolean values, there is some default value. Like you said, some boolean to default false, and only if some condition changes to change it to true, for example. So it's like also, but it could be also done with if else, for example, if set to true, else set to false. But if you set before if this default value of Boolean to false or to true, you can, with, with this single if you can change it, change it to, to the opposite, for example. Okay, okay. So it seems like if then has a backup plan, if does not have a backup plan, kind of, right? 
and sort of. You can you you can you could always refactor if like if alone to if else, but you you can just skip. You you muted, uh, Chris. Oh, cut off. Sorry. Uh, That's okay. Uh, I, I wanted to say that you, you can always refactor if alone to if else structure. But okay. if you if you build it some differently, then you, you just use if alone. But you could always just change the code to make it if else. Okay. All right. Thank you. Was that did that help clarify it at all for you, Jaya? Yeah, and I'm gonna check the chat to see what others have said. Okay. Awesome. Let us know if you still got any uh, points of uh, confusion or anything there. Um, anybody else got any questions? Dave or Christian or Auntie? Auntie, how's it going, man? Aunt, Auntie's a good friend. Nice to see you here. I have a question, actually. Are, are career development questions allowed at all? Absolutely. No. Absolutely. Okay. Um, perfect. So I'm kind of in an interesting just transition phase. I just left uh, telehealth and software to go to um, commercial real estate investment management. Um, so I was a BI analyst at UpDocs and now working for LaSalle as a data engineer and like senior looker developer. So BI developer development really, um, you know, I find myself as I switch to a new industry, even in just my first week and a half, like debating how much time do I put towards learning the new business and how much time do I put towards, you know, fully understanding the overall environment and structure as far as the data architecture and engineering side of things go. So I was just wondering or looking for tips and tricks that you might have for starting a new job and kind of balancing the two from a business understanding as well as the, the technical like data engineering side. I'd say, man, those two are, I think, a little bit more linked than, than you might think um, because there's ultimately business decisions that drove current architecture. So um it's interesting because one of my one of my colleagues, um, he's he's just started this role as a data architect. We're starting a data strategy at, at the at the team, and he's asking the same thing. He's coming from a software developer background, sure. now in a data architect type of role, and he's he's like, dude, I don't know what proportion of my time I should spend to understand business. What proportion should I st uh, spend to understand you know data infrastructure and stuff like this? Yeah. Um, and I'm like, yeah, well, they're kind of linked together right? Um, what should, I mean, depending on your role, right? If your role is data architect, then I would say focus more on understanding the data uh, sure. infrastructure and what's going on. But through doing that, I think you'll understand more business processes, right? Because ultimately, like, like there's, there's a real world that exists, right? And as a byproduct of the real world, things get captured in databases, actions get captured in systems and things like this, right? Uh, and then things happen to that data, that raw data un undergoes transformations, whatever, until it finds its final home to be ingested by whoever and used by whoever sure. later, right? So as much as you can understand that real world and how the real world and its interaction with whatever systems you're working with influences the tangible byproduct that, that is data, um, you know, however much of that you need to understand to do your job, I think is, is sufficient amount. That's like the most cop-out answer I have. <laughs> no, no, no. That, I, I think that framework is, is awesome. I, I, I ap appreciate it. Yeah. That's, um, that's super helpful actually just going into this week. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Uh, I'll, I'll add something there. I mean, like the business understanding is more like marinating, you know, over time and, sure. and technical stuff you got to like figure out that's more focused, intense, uh, the acquisition of like knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, definitely just a little overwhelmed right now. So that's kind of why I'm just going there with that question, but yeah, the business stuff, I mean, as you solve problems uh, over time, you'll, you'll, and, and keep, sure. just keep reading industry stuff. And uh, yeah, and I'm just so new to like real estate and investment management, like all these like financial terms are being thrown at me. I feel like I'm in essentials of finance in business school again. Yeah. But, uh, you know, fine. Uh, finance is a little more technical side of business. So do, uh, do an online uh, course, uh, which is focused on, yeah, yeah. on that subject. Yeah, sure. But as these terms get tossed at you, just pause and say, hey, man, like dumb question here. Uh, but what's that mean? Can you, can you guys demystify that for me real quick? And people will be happy to do it. So uh, by all means, ask those questions. 
with any terms that come up, um, don't be afraid of, of asking questions. I think that's the biggest bit of advice I can give you. Uh, but in terms of um, how to deal with your manager and how to work through those type of expectations, I think a really good book is called The First 90 Days. Okay. I highly recommend that to anybody who is starting a new job um, or maybe wants to start a or maybe has been feeling stagnant in their current role and wants to approach it with fresh eyes and wants to help better themselves in their current role. That's, that's a great read. First 90 days. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And also I would like to add, uh, if, if, if finance is like something like you are new to, or you have to like, you want to get some understanding, I think uh, there's a book, a course, or something like finance for non-finance. Um, I, 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 I did take that like as a training within my organization and I, I'm pretty sure it exists outside in the world as well. It is super helpful. It's not too technical and it gives you a rough idea of what the perfect is like. Yeah, I mean, just new to the industry, you know, it's, I, I took a class in college, right? But what does that really mean in the, in the large scheme of things when you're actually like in the weeds with it, you know, working for investment management. So yeah, yeah I appreciate it. And Udemy, you know, bunch of free courses on there that you can try to type in so maybe if you got like you know type in like real estate finance or whatever see what comes up you might find some some useful in there perfect yeah thank you and another book just to kind of understand business type of stuff in terms of what matters to business people is uh this one right here lean analytics uh this is just all about how to define metrics and kpis and stuff like that i don't think that they talk specifically about real estate, but they talk about different business models like e-commerce, software as a service, free mobile apps, media sites, user-generated content sites, two-sided marketplace, uh, which I think is real estate. So that's definitely applicable there. Um, and the authors of this book, Alistair Crawl and Benjamin Yaskovitz, they have a free course that's available on Udemy. It's only like an hour or so. So definitely check that out. And Alistair was also on uh, my podcast. Um, so check that interview out wow. if you'd like to to get to know the man behind the metrics. Christoph wants to know the pile of books that I have behind me. All right, uh, yeah. So, uh, so as you guys know, I'm a principal mentor at Data Science Dream Job and as uh, I have a workshop. So as principal mentor at Data Science Dream Job, I teach one technical workshop a month. Uh, this month's technical workshop is a uh, Bayes theorem, like an introduction to Bayes theorem. So I was going through a bunch of books to um, to see any references to Bayes theorem, any interesting applications, any interesting ways for me to talk about that. Um, but yeah, so in it, you know, I've got this book here, Hannah Fry's Hello World, which is a pretty good book. It's all about why we shouldn't blindly trust the output of algorithms that we should still uh, have human judgment kind of you know prevail over over algorithmic out output this is a really good book algorithms to live by um i like this book a lot um it's it's cool to see like all the it, it's it's essentially the computer science of human decisions so it takes algorithms from computer science and then maps them onto how humans make decisions and talks about the connection between the two so it's really really interesting uh like this book a lot um there's a what was the chapter I was reading uh, that I liked a lot. So obviously, like the, the game theory chapter was one of my favorites because that's something I'm really really interested in. But uh, the chapter on randomness I found to be really really good as well. And then this is the classic, the signal and the noise by Nate Silver. Um, why so many predictions fail, but some don't. A visual guide to Bayes theorem that's useful. <laughs> Cartoon guide to statistics. Uh, and this is uh, How Not to Be Wrong, The Power of Mathematical Thinking by Jordan Ellenberg. So I'm interviewing Jordan Ellenberg at the end of May. Uh, we're going to talk about his new book called Shape. So his new book, Shape, is all about um, machine learning and, and data science and stuff like that. But uh, New York Times bestselling author, Jordan Ellenberg, Power of Mathematical Thinking. This is a great book. Uh, How to Measure Anything by Douglas Hubbard, who was also on my podcast. This is... Uh, this book is really good. This book is fantastic. Um, and then Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Um, so this, like, you know, I, I, this, 
okay, let me rephrase that. That that all came out like a jumbled bunch of words, but I'm focusing this summer on primarily reading only books that are uh, related to my field. Um, So I'm only going to be reading books that are uh, books such as this, like these books, like I haven't read all of them all the way through, like I'll pick up and I'll read a chapter or two and then I'll bounce around. I'll take another book and read another chapter from that. Uh, But I want to focus primarily on like uh, math and data science type of books. I got a bunch of other ones there that I'll be reading um, that are not behind me. Um, Also be reading a lot of economics and stuff microeconomics at least brushing up on that because it's been quite some time since my undergraduate years uh, where I did a lot of econometrics um, just you know just to get back in touch with uh, with that stuff so yeah that's that's the pile of books that I had back there and then this one uh, this is case in point this is all about how to this was a book written for people who were wanting to become consultants and wanted to know how to get through consulting interviews but it's helpful for me to think about how to solve problems, um, which has been very, very interesting. So this is also um, something that I'll be making my way through this summer. But yeah, that's, a, that's that pile of books. Well, how, how much do you actually read a day? Uh, at most days, I probably read about two hours in the morning. Yeah, I probably spend about two hours reading every day. That's not counting the time that I spend listening to audiobooks when I'm walking. So audiobooks while I'm walking is probably another uh, hour and a half. Yeah. Or And that also doesn't count the time I spend listening to books while I'm in the shower. Um, so <laughs> That's a lot. That's a yeah, lot. yeah, yeah. So a lot of input, then I'll, I'll pause and then I'll think through stuff. Uh, but yeah, I love I love reading, I love reading a lot. So I got a good, expensive notebook that I just take notes in. It's a com- what I call a commonplace book. It's just to compare the size from my normal journal. Uh, so here's a normal journal where I'll just journal things about, and here's this commonplace book. So it's uh, about double the size. I'll also spend a lot of time reading philosophy this summer as well do more philosophy uh dave go for it do you keep uh, jumping between books or just finish one and then next finish no. or... i've got no attachment or desire to finish a book all the way through like that doesn't matter to me um i'll bounce around like if i'll, I'll look through a table of contents i'll say oh, does this sound interesting okay cool well, you know, let me read that today and then you know if i want to keep reading i will or I'll jump to another book and say, oh, this sounds interesting. Let's let's read this today. So I never really have the um, desire to read a book all the way through. Like, do I finish books all the way through? Yeah, I do. But, but there's some books where I'll just pick them down, put them up, and, you know, and read some, not read some, skip around, bounce around. Yeah, these are great books. Highly recommend. Highly recommend these. Um, so, yeah. what's your favorite? I, I, book? I try to listen to something in the shower. How do you do that? Like with the sound of the water. <laughs> <laughs> I've got this uh, waterproof Bose speaker. That's like those uh, sound oh. things. It's like, you know, what I'm talking about. They're like those rectangular shape, and the outside of it is completely like waterproof. So I'll just put that on a sh- like a little shelf in my shower and just. Put that up oh, volume okay. up and, and listen to that. Great suggestion. All right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, any other questions? I'm happy to take on any questions. Sumo. Yeah, li- life changing books. Life changing books. Uh, so, the most life changing books were not books that were related to my field. So, the uh, most life changing book I'd say was there's three books I read uh, kind of simultaneously that really changed my life and that was mindset by carol dweck followed by grit by angela duckworth and then the power of habit by charles duhigg Um, so all of those ideas and those books kind of molded their way together collided together and like updated my belief system and just made me a much more happier person at the end of the day like uh, great books Um, 
another good book, uh, Mastery is another good one by uh, Robert Greene. So who I also interviewed, which is available on the podcast for you to listen to. So check that one out. Um, I listened to this episode this week, actually. Uh, what'd you think? Uh, it was nice. I mean, I fi finally found some time to, to listen to your podcast. And this week I listened to two episodes. So Robert Greene was one and the other one was with Kate Strashny. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's uh, how I uh, knew there was a Harper <laughs> and you, <laughs> you were thinking about changing your name. That's yeah. crazy. Harper Simpson, I was about to change my name. Nice. Yeah, it was uh, tough, I man. I wasn't getting calls back for a, it's actually a bit of advice that somebody had given me. They're like, oh, well, you know, you have a very foreign sounding name. And I was like, yeah, but I'm, I'm American. Like I'm born and raised in the States. Like, no, you should probably anglicize your name, you know, so so you don't sound like you're foreign. And I was like, okay, well, Harper Singson then? Like, my name is Harpreet Singh Sohota, so I'll just become Harper Singson. And I was about to change my name, but I did not. I is like, that no. Simpson as in, like, the Bart Simpson or, or, or something else? Singh, like Singh, oh. son. So S-I-N-G-H-S-O-N. -S yeah, got it, got it, got it. Yeah. Harper yeah. Singson, yeah. And then I was like, well, the names Jonathan and Nathaniel and Bartholomew, they have more syllables than my name. Like, my name is two syllables. And I was like, all right, well, if these motherfuckers can pronounce those names, they can say mine. So that's why I decided to, to not do it. So aren't you Canadian? Uh, aren't you in I, Canada? I live in Canada now, yeah, but I'm, okay. I'm American. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just uh, find uh, Lily Singh awesome. <laughs> yeah, Lily Singh's awesome. I've been trying to get some of those people onto my podcast, but to no avail. I guess <laughs> I'm not big enough yet. I reached out to Jay Shetty, Robin Sharma, Lily Singh, Humble the Poet, all these people. None of them, none of them responded to me. All right. Oh, man. In time, man, in time. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens. The Robert Green episode was a, that was next level. I really enjoyed that. Oh, dude, I'm glad. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, he's, yeah. Uh, he's, he's been on a lot of interviews, right? He's, he's interviewed quite a lot and he's been interviewed by some of the greatest. And for him to say like, this is one of the most interesting interviews that I've ever had. I was like, holy shit, man. Like that blew me away. I was like, all right, you should have, you should have seen the after if like, if I would have kept the camera rolling, like, you would see me jumping up and down. Like, yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I also interviewed James Altucher. That'll be coming out in June or July, maybe. Uh, James Altucher's, you know, he's got his own podcast. He's written a few books as well. Um, so that was he's really the guy good. on Wall Street, right? The the yeah, old yeah. hedge fund guy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He said from the yeah. internet uh, first internet dot com days. Yeah. <laughs> That's him. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly him, James Altucher. Yeah. So and did you manage to uh, reach Carl Newport, the author of Deep Work? I emailed him and I emailed his representative. Um, no, none of them got back to me. So Cal Newport's also like him and Scott Young are Scott Young wrote, wrote ultra learning. You know, they're good friends. Um, and I've interviewed Scott Young. I've had him on my podcast. So maybe I could shoot Scott a message and say, Hey, uh, <laughs> you think you can get me in touch with, uh, Cal Newport, that'll be that'll be awesome. But yeah, a bunch of bunch of cool people that uh, that I got coming on. So like I mentioned, Dana McKenzie, the book, you know, co-author of Book of Why, Jordan Ellenberg, who wrote that How Not to Be Wrong, and his new book he's coming up, um, which he sent me a copy of that I need to read through. Uh, so those will be they'll be good 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 episodes for sure. Yeah, I'm excited. Then uh, after. After May, I'm taking a break from recording interviews and I'll have enough interviews done and uploaded to last me until uh, essentially mid-February of, of next year. So I'll have all that stuff automated. So it gives me time to just focus on other stuff. I might start writing more um, and doing, doing some blog posts and stuff like that. We'll see. We'll see. 
Uh, but yeah, if anybody else has questions on anything whatsoever, please do. I'm just talking to Phil time. So my, my question about life changing book was actually to everybody. So if oh, okay. anyone else would like to share, I, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, please. I'd love to hear that too. I mean, for, for me, I, I can uh, say that a book that I keep thinking about, and I think it made a big impact and I read it in college. So that's like, you know, 25 years back. Uh, more than that, is uh, Small is Beautiful uh, by an economist uh, from the mid uh, uh, sort of uh, 20th century, uh, e. E. Schumacher. And uh, Small is Beautiful, you kind of like uh, see that uh, philosophy actually playing out this whole like theory of disruption and how industries get disrupted. Also sort of uh, somehow it uh, ties back to that, you know, like the smallest beautiful thinking. Like, I mean, if you look at some of the biggest companies in any industry, they got disrupted by a small player who basically came like faster, better, cheaper uh, with that sort of product. And, and then kind of like grew up and disrupted. And, uh, and so like small footprints and, and small is beautiful is all uh, even about sustainable thinking and like, and uh, you know, environmentally conscious all of that was part of that thinking back then, but I just sort of see it play through uh, even business and industries uh, that uh, small footprint companies who who just sort of focus on on products that are uh, that that are like faster, better, cheaper, they they end up winning. I, I just found that, and 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 I kind of get, get drawn towards that idea and uh, and that sort those sort of business models and all. You were Sorry, guys. I was yeah. I was muted. Yeah, I was gonna say. So, uh, what would you say was like kind of like the biggest takeaway from that book that's really helped throughout your career? I mean, the whole uh, idea of like uh, sort of being uh, being uh, nimble and and keeping a footprint like small and 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 uh, for being like resource. Conscious, sort of conscious about the resources you're consuming to to solve any problem, right? And keeping that, uh, uh, yeah, thinking thinking in terms of like simplicity, and uh, and you can uh, you can end up like solving big problems if you kind of like say say that that's a focus, you know, keeping things simple. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I think that's the idea. I like that. Anybody else want to share a life-changing book that they have um, read? Yeah, I can share. It's, it's not related to my career, but it's just my personal belief system. I was probably like 15 or 16 years old. Uh, when I first read, uh, it was not even a book. It was like a, a magazine or like a smaller book by Osho, about Osho. Oh, yeah. And it was yeah. about, I think it was about the mind the mind or something, the topics was that. And yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, when I first read that and after that, my belief system all changed. And uh, like my family, my parents are Christian, my brother and all other religions are Hindu, but I like, I, I decided I'm not gonna be pursuing any religion and at the early age. And that book was, that was really key to me actually. Uh, to make me think to the good that way. Actually, yeah, it's amazing. And I then like after that. that, I read uh, uh, one of one of his uh, very popular book, uh, uh, and that was also pretty good. Uh, have you read anything by uh, Kapil Gupta? No. Yeah, you might, I'm not you might... really a book reader at that. Yeah, point. yeah. <laughs> but yeah. that was yeah, exceptional. Uh, what was the name again? Uh, Kapil Gupta. Uh, so he's he's interesting. He's a more modern day type of guys he's, he's always talking about uh talking about the mind and how to achieve no mind but he's done an interview with uh uh novel Ravikant. um so i'll send you the link to that as well and it's all about conquering the mind uh, and and uh keep calling him naval but we could say it the indian way novel he's uh he's big into osho as well so you might you might enjoy that Right. I'm I'm not into Osho though. I, I uh, only just... yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I was into him for like a couple of years after I read a book, but then 
now I like I I'm way beyond that. I, yeah. I, <laughs> Fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. I'll give you a, a link to this in, interesting podcast. It's only like 25, 30 minutes, something like that, but it's, oh, 40 minutes, sorry. Uh, 20 minutes if you watch it on double speed. Um, right on. Yeah. I have a question I would ask Please. later. Let's no, no. First go through this uh, life-changing thing first, if anyone wants to share. No, we'll, we'll circle back to, to, to the books, but let's, let's take your question first. Okay, so... Uh, so from last week, I did mention you that I'm trying to transition into data science, right? So in coming weeks, I have to do some project, actually. I was wondering uh, if you know of any book or any, any, any resource that uh, where the, uh, the, any interesting project on natural language processing, because uh, that is something new to me and I wanted to do a, a a portfolio kind of project on that one but all i can find is like a lot of stuff has been already been done and i wanted to like yeah give some idea like one uh, something new application on that field or something any, any, any exciting yeah actually nlp uh, is a big area of interest for for christoph so i mean i would i would say maybe link up with christoph to see if you guys can find a project to work on but just for the audience christoph since uh you're, you're my de facto NLP expert here. If somebody was looking to explore NLP as a uh, area of interest, what are some uh, types of projects that they could undertake? That's a really difficult question. Do, do you have any idea what type of tasks uh, you'd like to solve? Because NLP is like, there's plenty types, like you can do sentiment analysis, syn syntactic, semantic analysis. You can do information extraction, test, text summarization. You can build chatbots if you like. You can build some translators. I mean, there's, there's a lot of questions you, you'd have to answer first before you actually start a project. And then the next question would be, uh, what's the best way to get uh, some data to do that? So I, I don't feel I, I can answer this question right now, but we can really talk about it later if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, um, I would say a good place to maybe start is... Um, Kaggle. Look, yeah, Kaggle, Kaggle is obviously, you know, they're, they're full with... Uh, with all sorts of different projects, but um, maybe if you look at uh, this right here from Comet ML, since you know they're the folks paying the bills, I wanna show you guys this really interesting um, project that they have that you can follow along with. Uh, and this is natural language processing for US airline sentiment analysis. And this is a great opportunity for you to actually learn some basics of NLP, you get a good introduction to NLP, but also to use Comet ML for hyperparameter optimization and running experiments. So I'm gonna link you to this. I would recommend checking this out and there's an associated GitHub page with it. Um, you can find like the link right here. Um, but yeah, I'll give you a link to this and hopefully this, this can get you kind of uh, started on the right path. Um, do we misunderstand the question at all, Suman, or was that kind of what you were, were looking for? Let, let me know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think what Chris said was right, because it's really hard to, I mean, I am, yeah, I'm even having a hard time to brainstorm, like, yeah. ideas. So. so, yeah, definitely take, take a look at this blog post. It's really well written and, and thorough, and you get a good introduction to it. Um, and you know, they're working on sentiment analysis, which I think is a very, very common, um, you know, problem in NLP. Uh, there's also this right here, another uh, tutorial done by Comet ML with uh, Hugging Face, and Hugging Face is a NLP library. Um, so you can take a look at this as well, which would be uh, quite interesting to to peep out. So I'll link to both of these right here in the chat and i'll include links um cool. thank you to uh to this in the show notes as well 
Uh, any questions from uh, anybody else in the audience there? Right, doesn't look like it. Christian, Christian, you got a podcast too, don't you? Or did I yeah, I do. Um, yeah. And I'm actually going to pivot it to be more of a data focused podcast starting in June. Um, nice. So I had Nicholas Lathorpe on about two months ago now, and yeah. he was just an awesome guy to talk to. He's got some extremely interesting background, um, yeah. and it kind of inspired me. I honestly, my podcast was pretty broad. I think when I started it three years ago, right out of college, I didn't fully understand the importance of a niche. So that was always kind of my number one uh, gripe with it, I guess, if you will. Uh, but I'm going to be kind of focusing it down and extending the brand, essentially a passion to knowledge. So nice. Yeah. I like that, man. Yeah, yeah. Like the, the niche part is, is important because if you make a podcast for everyone, then really it's for no one. Uh, yeah. Right. So having a niche down is, is important. And I think I, followed that very firmly with the first maybe 20 or so episodes with my podcast, just only data scientist. Sure. And then I was like, okay, now that I've firmly got people hooked into the podcast, now I'm just going to explore whatever I want and hopefully awesome. the data scientist. So I, I did a pivot, right? Uh, so my pivot was just this nebulous data science podcast to, okay, now I'm the only pot self-development podcast for data scientists. So that became my niche. And I was like, okay, well, that opens me up to a wide variety of things, right? Because I said, okay, it's the only self-development for data scientists, self-development podcast for data scientists with the goal of introducing data scientists to people, ideas, conversations that are going to inspire creativity, innovation with yeah. themselves so that they can go and, and inspire other people. So now aligned with that mission, it's like, okay, well, I can interview a whole range of people that I find to be fascinating or who have written books that I find to be really interesting that I want to help discuss and spread awareness about. Yeah, it's amazing. And, uh, yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm not a data scientist, you know, I'm really more of analyst and uh, like bi and, and data engineering now so that's I think still data science to, man that's still data i know science I, I know it's the umbrella it's i guess yeah. when i think of data science though it's like statistics and machine learning like that's really yeah. where like i i would you know consider myself to be actually practicing data science um but essentially i don't know like something around impact and communication i think is is kind of where i'm going with some kind nice. of niche around that so nice well yeah. i'd recommend getting in touch with um a couple of people i mean there's uh Gilbert Ikellenboom, uh, who's a good friend. Okay. He wrote People Skills for Analytical Think. Uh, yeah, People Skills for Analytical Thinkers. Okay. Uh, so he's a good member of our community. He's a data guy as well. So awesome. definitely, definitely recommend checking him out. Fantastic. I'm actually uh, my first guest that I've got locked in. You inspired me. Uh, I'm actually having Curtis Pikes on. So <laughs> nice. That's yeah. He's a good yeah. Friend. He's. Yeah. The fact that he's a self-taught machine learning engineer is just really, really remarkable. So, yeah, yeah, Curtis is cool, man. He was also a cult leader at one point. Hope so you guys get a chance to talk about that. Which is yeah, <laughs> that's right, that's right. I remember that episode you did with him. Yeah, yeah, Curtis is wow. a good friend of mine. Um, yeah, that that's awesome, man. There's somebody else on the tip of my tongue that just escaped me. Um, if I remember, I'll. I'll put you in, in touch for sure no, i appreciate it yeah right on man well that's awesome dude like you know podcasting is such a big space we should all help each other right yeah, when it comes to like when it comes to data podcasts it's like okay well my, my mentality is a bit different it's like i'm not competing against john crone for his audience with the super data science podcast i'm not competing against um Ken's nearest neighbors podcast. I'm not competing against Revit's show. I'm not com competing against um, how to get an analytics job or anything like that. Uh, I'm competing against Joe Rogan, Tom Bilyeu, Tim Ferriss. Right, that's the mentality I have. Wow. It's like I want to be the greatest podcast host on the face of the planet. It's awesome. Uh, that's my. That's like that's that's my goal, right? And whether or not that is true, I tell myself that. I am the greatest podcast host. Why? Because that makes me act in a certain way. Because how would the greatest podcast host treat his guests on this show? What kind of interactions would they have? How would they, how would they prepare for the interview? How would they research? How would they introduce their guests? How would they come up with questions? How would they make it fun for their guests? 
Uh, so that's kind of like the way I think about it. It's like, okay, if I am the greatest podcast host in the world, how would I behave? And then let me behave like that. Wow. Your random question generator too at the end. That is such a brilliant idea, man. Like yeah. just so unique to think of that. Yeah. Yeah. Was, I, I used to close every episode with the, with the question, uh, what's the one thing you want people to learn from your story? And then I had a bunch of other uh, questions that I always asked. And then my cousin, she was, was uh, helping me out with, um, with some stuff with the podcast. And she's like, do you need to switch it up? This is too boring. <laughs> like you keep asking the same questions. And I was like, Oh shit. All right, cool. <laughs> so, so, so I switched it up, got the random question generator. And then I swapped out that last question. What's the one thing you want people to learn from your story to something more powerful, which is, you know, it's a hundred years in the future. What do you want to be remembered for? And I think that's like kind of a, one thing that's helped me with my podcast is that structure. And I think that structure really helped, right? There's the, there's the, like every minute detail of the structure, like the music that plays in the background during the sizzler to the leading in like song track to my introduction of the guest to the questions. And then that last question kind of delineates, like, you know, it, it's like a marker for, for my audience that, okay, well, we're about to round, wind things down. So I feel like that structure kind of helps. And it's just that consistent format every episode that helps me make the quality that much better. And I, I hope that the audience fun. notices that. Um, I definitely, yeah, yeah. I, it's definitely inspiring. Yeah. All right, man. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you, glad you enjoy it. So like, I've got this idea, like, like, so one of my, one of my like heroes is Naval Ravikant, right? Like, I absolutely love this guy. Um, I, I this, before I get into what I was planning on doing, I was thinking about a counterfactual reality, right? What if in this counterfactual reality, my social media of choice was not Instagram or Facebook, but Twitter instead? Like, how would my life have been different? Because I probably would have been exposed to a wide number of other people who are uh, much more intelligent and probably would have planted seeds of wisdom and ideas in my head that would have bore far more fruit over the course of my life than just random pictures on Instagram or Facebook status updates about chain letters and things like that. Um, so I was having that thought experiment because if way back in the days, if I would have chosen to be on Twitter... I probably would have been exposed to Naval Ravikant earlier and his ideas earlier, and it would have impacted my life for the better up until this point. But nonetheless, grateful that I was exposed to his ideas. But the, the point of, of that was uh, I want to interview Naval Ravikant. He'll probably never come on my podcast. So instead, I'm going to create a tweet storm. And on this tweet storm, I'm just going to tag him with questions. Like here's, And they have to be good questions. They have to be really insightful questions, right? So I'm going to just do a tweet storm, maybe 12 questions, uh, just based on stuff that I've heard him talk about that, that ideas have just been kind of sitting in my mind and, and I need clarification on it. Um, and he'll either ignore the tweet storm, which is fine, which is, I mean, the result of him ignoring the tweet storm is the exact same result as if I didn't do it. Right. So that that's a wash. It doesn't matter. Um, or he'll respond selectively to some questions, which is a win. Or he'll respond to all of them, which is also a win. Or he'll be like, hey, these are interesting. Let's get on Clubhouse and have a conversation, which is an even bigger win. Because then I de facto get him onto the podcast by having a Clubhouse conversation. Right. So each one of these possible, out, you know, there's the, the, no re, the no response scenario. That's probably, you know, in a thousand parallel universes, that's going to happen maybe 750 of them, right? But in 250 of them, I get some sort of a response, right? And the expected payout of me getting a result from, from that or response from him far outweighs not doing anything. Does that makes sense. I'm trying to explain my, my logic the way I'm thinking about this, which I know is probably kind of confusing and I sound like a crazy person, but this is the way I think about the world. Um, yeah. So that's, that's something that will be happening soon. I'm just like distilling down the questions. I need like 12 questions. And I don't know why, but the number 12 seems right. So I have 12 questions I need to ask him. Uh, and they have to be the most insightful questions ever. Um, so hopefully sometime by the end of this summer, I could do that. I have a question for you, uh, Harpreet. 
yeah this uh, twitter right um i'm a, i have a twitter account too and there's a lot of data people in there tons of them who provide lots of lots of valuable information how do you keep up with it i mean I've had a whole slew yeah. of people that I follow. I mean, it, it can't get, get overwhelming. And, uh, you know, it's it takes up a lot of time. How do you keep up with it? Yeah, so Twitter is, right now, it's not my my uh, social media of choice still. It's still just LinkedIn. Um, so, and even then, like, this doesn't sound bad, but like I just ignore most things most data people say. Like everyone's saying the same shit to me at some point, right? Everybody's either trying to be trying to tell me how to become a data scientist that I need to learn SQL, or that I need to pick up some stuff from Python. Like everyone's telling me the same fucking shit. Uh, so I don't I don't really follow many days, I, or I don't even check my LinkedIn feed like that often. Like everything I do on LinkedIn is is completely automated. So I just like schedule stuff out. Um, so that's one thing. I just ignore everything. So that's how I kind of keep up with it. So, yeah. <laughs> Another question for you then. Is there a certain group of people you follow that you found of value that maybe yeah, so, one two, three people that you know of? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm part of an engagement pod. So I have a group message with a bunch of people and um, we kind of reciprocate and help amplify each other's post. Um, you know, it's game theory in action, right? Um, you know, they, they'll post in the group chat and, you know, I, I'll log in maybe once every two or three days and try to catch up and smash the like on all their, all their uh, posts that I'm, you know, returning the favor. Um, but that's about it. And that's, you know, that's the usual suspects. There's, there's Kate, George, Scott Taylor, um, Ravit, who else is in there? A bunch of people, Susan Walsh, Tom Ives, things like that. Um, Dave, I mean, they, they all create great content, amazing content. I just don't have time to really pay attention to any of it. Thank you. That being said, I, I somehow always do manage to find time to see how many people have reacted to my posts, which is, it's weird. Uh, <laughs> so go ahead and go for it. So what do you say about blogging? Like how important is it for a data scientist to be like, actively blogging like i am uh, new to this game i just started debugging uh, your blog's probably not going to get you hired uh, but it yeah. will help you think clearly and it will help you communicate thoughts and contribute value um if you're blogging in hopes of getting a job probably not the right way to do it i'd probably spend my time working on a personal project that can highlight my technical ability but that being said, if your blog is talking about your personal project and presenting it, then that's, that's fine. Uh, any event though, like you need to be a good writer just in life in general, like pick up this book and like, you know, and you'll see how many, how well worn I've got it. And this is just business writing for dummies and just, just notes and notes and notes. Um, Cause writing is important. Clear writing means clear thinking. Um, so writing is important for communication. Do you need to have a data science blog to get a job in data science? No. Uh, I would optimize my time for creating a project if you do not already have a project. If you have already created two to three projects, then write, then write blogs about your projects, not do more projects. Because that way you're flexing that communication muscle. You're flexing that writing skill. Writing is super, super important. If you don't have the time to go through a book, um, there's several courses on LinkedIn uh, that are about business writing, but even better than, than LinkedIn, uh, Scott Adams, the creator of the Dilbert comic, wrote a blog post called The Day You Became a Better Writer. Uh, short read that will get you the basics of, of good business writing. He's also got a YouTube video that's maybe about 40 minutes. That's all about just how to become a better writer. So definitely check that out. Um, then there's another YouTube video that's much longer, uh, about an hour and a half from the Leadership Lab. And it's about um, writing, uh, transitioning from academics to industry and how to, how to bridge that gap as a writer, uh, the Leadership Lab. That's very good. This one's pretty good as well. Everybody writes. That's decent book so 
this is more for for content writing uh yeah but like i mean i, I mentioned i was writing earlier just because I, I like i i feel i need to do that to get the word out for my podcast like i don't have many blogs associated with my podcast like all the good content from everybody that's been on my podcast is trapped in audio um, and I need to un unlock that from the audio into written form so that it becomes searchable online so that people can find it because like you can type in search words but it doesn't mean that the internet is going to go into my audio file find the word and return my podcast as a result right um, so that's part of the reason why I want to focus on writing um, second half of the year a little bit is just to unlock all that great stuff that people are saying in the podcast repurpose it thank you yeah i think that's helpful i'm gonna follow those uh get those books yeah i'd, I'd optimize for the scott adams um the day you became a better writer maybe i could find it real quick um it might be even be scott adams business writing but yeah i'll find it real quick and send that to you uh, any other questions from anyone co co comments questions anything do let me know if i was to write an actual people at packed publishing keep hitting me up to write a book and they keep talking to me about writing books that i have no interest in writing and they keep trying to convince me that it's a good use of time it's like first of all you don't get to tell me what a good use of my time is because i'm ultimately the one that has to use my time uh so there's that and plus i don't want to write a, a textbook like that's boring like i would not write a textbook if i was to write a book it would be one of these type of books you know where it's talking about data science concepts but how they impact the world and things like that so i don't know like i'm, I'm really into bayesian statistics i was thinking about writing a book and just titling it the bayesian and it would just be like how bayesian thinking has uh, played out over the last you know 250 years in subtle ways where we haven't realized it um yeah so that's one topic another book i was thinking about writing uh which has an interesting title to it it's called i wish somebody gave me this book when i was your age and it's applicable to anyone from any age and it would just be like just it would essentially be a distillation of all the life-changing works that i've read and presenting it in one book in a clear concise manner um but then that's not really original because I'm taking other people's ideas and just spitting it out. Uh, it's hard to be original, man. Like it's fucking difficult. Like, like being, like trying to be original, trying to do and say something that's never been said or done. Like, fuck, man, it's tiring. Um, so I just hope to just do a bunch of shit, and hopefully something will happen. Yeah, even even if even if you think that you are original, or you might not be like knowing that like some more might have already done it or... yeah i mean the thing is common rhetorics of human dna are just like every one of us is or like unique as hell right um but it doesn't mean that the works that we create will be original most of it's going to be derivative which is fine because everyone's been exposed to you know a number of different stuff right and you take that synthesize it re-express it in any way you choose and maybe that's original um, but I like what Tor is saying here. Stop looking, just be you. That's original and communicate it. Yes, become the best in the world at being you. Keep redefining what you do until this is true. Uh, any other questions from anyone else? All right. Well, I guess if nobody else has questions, we can be begin to wrap it up. Um, what's coming up this week? Well, there's obviously Data Science Happy Hour on Friday. Uh, I've got a podcast episode being released this Friday as well. Um, I just can't remember which one it is. Uh, it'll be a surprise to you as it is to me when we see it released on Friday, but it'll be a good one. I can guarantee you that. Um, it might be the one I did with Dennis Rothman. I can't remember, but that one's coming out this Friday. So definitely check that out. And um I think that's the only announcement. I guess the other announcement is to please go and vote for the Data Community Content Creators Award because we need your help. We need your help to make this thing stand out. 
Um, and yes, the episode I'm releasing is this Friday with uh, Eleanor Todell. She wrote a book about how losing your job could be the best thing to happen to you. So we talk a lot about how your job doesn't define who you are as a person. That was a good episode. She was really cool um, from England. So she's got an English accent. So if you like English accents, you might want to tune into that episode. Suman, uh, last minute question or anything? Uh, uh, so all the podcasts that you post it will be in, in LinkedIn or? Yeah, so my podcast is available, uh, available everywhere. Um, so Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, what, Audible, like whatever you enjoy, or you can just go w- listen to it straight on the web right here. Uh, but every podcasting platform will have my podcast. If you guys do listen on Apple, please hook me up with a, a review, an honest review. Uh, somebody gave me a one-star review and they said that my podcast is not about data science. That is just an excuse for me to network with people, um, which is cool. And it's true. Uh, don't mean you got to give me a one-star review for it. Um, so uh, if you do give me a review that is less than five stars, at least tell me how I can improve and make it a better podcast, please. I would appreciate that. Um, but yeah, t- tune in everywhere. Suman, I got the link right there for you. I got it. Cool. Thanks. Right, right on, man. Mohit. Hey, no, just thanks for the going through all the books. Awesome list. I noted down all of them. <laughs> Great ideas, man. This... Right on. Well, thanks, man. Hopefully, I enjoyed, I enjoyed this hour. Yeah, hopefully uh, you come back. Like usually Iodeli joins us. Iodeli is the data evangelist at Comet ML. She unfortunately was not able to make it uh, here with us today. Um, hopefully she can join us next week. Uh, she's got, she's working on a book about ethics in in, uh, in machine learning and AI. Um, so I'm excited to, to read that book and talk to her about that once that's published. Um, hopefully she'll be back next week. But yeah, if anything else, uh, nobody has anything else. I appreciate you being here. Remember, folks, you've got one life on this planet. Why not try to do something big? Cheers, everyone.